Hello and welcome. This is NTA Tuesday Live and I'm Cyril Stober. Now, Nigeria has of recent been faced with the challenge of widespread codeine abuse among its teaming youth and some adults, a development that comes with negative consequences on health, social and economic life of affected communities. Now, a United Nations World Drug Report in 2014 ranked Nigeria fourth on the global ranking of countries with the most widespread use of illegal substances. Now, more worrisome is that a good percentage of the victims are the youth, who either due to peer pressure, poor parental care, or societal neglect, take to unconventional means of getting intoxicated, notably through cough syrup with codeine. It is believed that one of the most abused substances today is cough syrup with codeine. In places like Kano and Jigawa states, more than three million bottles of codeine syrup are believed to be consumed on a daily basis. A development that warranted the federal government to order an immediate ban on the issuance of permits for the importation of codeine as an active pharmaceutical ingredient for cough treatment. Now this action, although late, has been applauded by many, with attention being drawn to open drug markets believed to be responsible for the unwholesome distribution of the substances. It has also led to calls to step up surveillance and regulation so that the scourge among the team in youth is stemmed. But how did Nigeria get to the stage? And how best can the lapses that gave rise to the phenomenal increase in cases of drug abuse be addressed? That's some of what we'll be looking at tonight on NTA Tuesday Live. But first, let's get to see this report by Rabi Abdullah. Drug abuse and drug addiction can harm the body in different ways, from health problems to behavioral problems. It affects the brain a lot, and you find out at the end of the day, particularly the substances that you know cause dependence, uh, at the end of the day it can even make this person become frankly psychiatric. Kidney disease is very is a big problem in Nigeria right now, both among the young and the old. And some of them, actually, it is because of abuse. What is very worrisome to us now is that when we see people coming with uh, seizures, which you call, what the day people call convulsion, the first thought, if they are between 15 years and 30 years, and it's the first time the seizure is occurring, you must do a, a drug screen, you must do a toxicology for that patient. And most of the time, close to like 19 to 99% of the time, you are never wrong. The DC alone in our, in our teaching hospital have admitted close to five people. The last one was a 17-year-old young man who came with, with a stroke. And um, at the end of the day, after much probing, we found out that it was just um, drugs, trauma, codeine, and a mixture of others, which uh, he's not sure of, which he gets from his friends. The menace has, however, reached an alarming proportion among Nigerian youths, and in particular is that of cough syrups containing codeine. Cough syrup containing codeine was legal, but it was against the law to sell it to people without a doctor's prescription or those who did not have a pharmaceutical license. Codeine containing cough syrup, which is an issue now, used to be over-the-counter drug. Over-the-counter drug means anybody can walk in into a pharmacy or into anywhere and buy it. We saw this trend of abuse and we started shouting and eventually it was moved from over-the-counter drug to prescription-only drug. And when it is moved from prescription-only drug, it is not expected that from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to the retailer, there's supposed to be a trend. You can monitor it. It's moving from point A to point B. But because we have a chaotic drug distribution system, we have an open market, whereby people move products and go and dump. There are certain products which codeine containing cough syrup is inclusive, that should be handled by professionals. This lacuna has led to the creation of a worrisome population of individuals who have lost the power of self-control due to an addiction to codeine. The Nigerian Senate estimates that as many as 3 million bottles of such brand of cough syrup are consumed on a daily basis in two states of Kano and Jigawa alone. Youths around the country abuse more than codeine. They abuse tramadol, rohypnol, also called roach, and lexitan. They sniff glue, gum, and mentholated spirits. 
having earlier set up the Codin Control and other related matters working group. The federal government declared on May 1st a ban on further issuance of permits for the importation of codeine as active pharmaceutical ingredients for calf preparations, as well as the manufacture and marketing of calf syrups containing codeine, following the intensity of the abuse. Pharmacy Council and LAVDAC are meeting with the stakeholders to drop our strategies to mop up all the codeine containing calf preparations in the system. Thereafter, strategies will be put in place on, on the disposal. What is the state of the rehabilitation centers for addicts? Would the federal government also ban the other drugs and substances that the young abuse in order to get high? What will be the effect of a ban on these medications for citizens who need them as part of a health regimen and who do not abuse them? What happens to codeine for uses other than in calf syrups? Tuesday Live is taking a look at this and other matters arising from codeine addiction and the federal government ban. In Abuja, Rabi Abdullah, Antio News. And that report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Let's start off by introducing our guests. We'd like to welcome to this program Dr. Abdullahi Umar Ganduji, who is the governor of Kano State. Governor, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Siri. All right. We'd also like to welcome tonight Professor Isaac Adewale, who is the Minister of Health. Minister, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Siri. Good evening. All right. Also joining us here tonight is Sani Madugu, who is Controller of Customs Enforcement Headquarters. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, sir. All right. Also joining us from uh, Lagos Network Center, we have Ibrahim Babashehu of the Pharmacists Council of Nigeria. Uh, thanks for being here, Ibrahim Babashehu. And uh, beside him there, also in our Lagos studio, is Mabu Ulubenga, who is Director Operations and General Investigations of the NDLEA, that's the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. Thanks for being with us, gentlemen. All right, as usual, we acquaint you with the procedure. At the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. The various platforms will be on your screens. We advise you to take advantage of them. And uh, also, we say this all the time, for those who will be phoning in tonight, when your call gets through to the studio, do us a favor, turn down the volume of your TV set. Just reduce the volume. That's the way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And uh, the best way to know that your call has been passed through is you'll see your name appear on screen. Once you see your name on screen, it means the call has been passed through to the studio. So just go straight ahead and ask your question or make a comment. Don't bother too much about the greetings. And uh, we assure you, our guests will take up those issues that you raise. And uh, let me just add that, just keep it brief and straight to the point. And uh, that's so others can get on the platform too and contribute to tonight's discussion. And so, let's start off. And... Uh, Perhaps it would be best to situate this correctly. And let's turn to the Minister of Health and say, well, this documentary, uh, which was shown on the station by the BBC, it led to an outrage all over the country. And there were, you know, so many people who had to speak out. And it would seem as if the federal government immediately after took a decision. Now, the question is, why did it take so long? Hasn't this been in the public domain for quite a while? Thank you so much, Cyril. Um, l let me set the record straight. Um, it is a really coincidence that the ban um, occurred on May 1st. But I must also admit that the BBC documentary added flavor to the ban. Um, it has helped us to really undercover, uh, uncover the network and the challenges with the distribution system. Because those who denied being part of these abuse denied in the past, but they were sure don't tell it. So it was quite helpful, and I knew it was coming. And uh, I told my contact that we were already going to act big even before the documentary was shown. So I knew that documentary was coming. But let me also say clearly that the National Assembly um, debated the issue of the menace in December. I dispatched a director of food and drug services to Kano, also in December. 
And he came back and um, gave me a very terrible report ab about the drug situation in Kano. But I'm also aware through informal contact that is, this problem is beyond Kano. We have a problem in Lagos, we have in many of our universities, in secondary schools, in Kebi, in Nonija. So it's, it's, it's a national problem. And so uh, in order to be scientific about this, uh, we constituted a committee. Um, we call it the codeine and other related matters, because it's not just codeine. And it's chaired by a dean of pharmacy in one of our universities. Uh, and so we chaired that committee to look comprehensively into developing short-term, mid-term, and long-term recommendations that were supposed to address in totality. Uh, it also enabled us to reflect on what we've been doing, which appeared not to be working effectively. We moved around the country. I was in Lagos. I was in Abba, I was in Onicha, and I met with the wholesalers. And I wonder that the National Distribution Guideline, which was launched by government in 2012, we will implement without delay. We were to start implementation 1st of January 2018, they begged. And at my numerous meetings, I then told them that we will move it to 1st of January 2019, and there will be no delay. We would grant them no further extension. Anybody found selling drugs outside regulated areas will be prosecuted and will sell these drugs. We've also upgraded 11 of our tertiary institutions to drug rehabilitation centers across the country. But to me, despite all that, we've trained over 1,600 people on counseling, on, uh, on handling drug abuse issues, but that's not enough. So we needed to act big. So when that committee submitted its report on April 12th, we knew that we have to move fast. But we needed to consult. We had to consult with NAPDA, we have to consult with Pharmacy Council of Nigeria, and we came out with, look, the thing is to nip it in the bud. We must stop the licenses. When we stop the licenses, there will be nothing to put in the coding. We consulted our physicians. Do we have an outbreak of cough in Nigeria? The answer is no. Under pressure around some kuti, cough mixtures were removed from the essential drug list. It's a lazy physician's attitude to treating cough. If anybody has cough, what you need to do is find out the cause of the cough. Cough mixture is not the solution to cough. Mm. And in any case, the cough mixture is only codeine will suppress the cough. Maybe that's not what is needed. If it's an infection, you don't need to suppress that cough. In fact, that fellow should cough it out. Maybe it's congestive cardiac problem with the lung so we will fluid. So cough mixture is the wrong thing to give anybody. So we will lose nothing by stopping this. So, and we went out and said, look, enough is enough. But subsequent activities that occurred, like going to those three companies, were helped by the BBC documentary. And we must be grateful for that documentary. All right, we'll return to some of the other issues that um, have arisen from your answers there. But um, let's come to the governor of Kano State. And uh, Kano would be one of those states in the north that has been hit hard by the incident of uh, youth particularly abusing uh, drugs and in this case, uh, cough syrup. Kudin, how bad is it in Kano? Thank you very much for this very for this question. Kano, being the commercial nerve center, northern part of Nigeria, and even commercial nerve center of some West African countries, there is always influx of people, and by implication, we have influx of youth looking for employment in Kano which is not available as such because most of our industries are dead due to lack of uh, power and uh, other problems. So the situation in Kano is terrible, like you earlier mentioned. Despite all our efforts, we have been tackling this problem for long, but now is a time where there must be a synergy between the federal government, the state government, and all stakeholders because it has reached the peak now. Our major problem is the availability of the syrup, is the unguided distribution of the syrup because Kano has become the center of distribution and this distribution uh, is not regulated, is not according to the national drug uh, distribution uh, guidelines. So we have a task force comprising of the police, the NAVDAC officials, 
the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria, and then the NDLEA, and all others that are concerned, we have convicted o over 300 uh, people have been convicted. And we have banned drugs, illicit drugs, fake drugs, expert drugs, you know, substandard drugs, over five billion this year. So you can see the effort that we have been putting. But as I earlier told you, the availability of this syrup is problem number one, which we are battling now. The issue of rehabilitation, of course, is there because some are already addicted and therefore we have to put all efforts in order to well, rehabilitate them. Right. But prevention is better than cure. That is okay. what the emphasis should be on the prevention now. All right. We will come to all that, and uh, as well as those who are already hooked on it and what can yeah. be done. But yeah. before we come to you, let's, let's go over to our Lagos uh, Network Center and speak with, the, uh, with Ibrahim uh, Babashehu of the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria. Like uh, someone just mentioned, the cough syrup, now let's take it into account what the Minister of Health just said. The cough syrup used to be easily available. You just walk, it was, you know, across the counter drugs. Uh, you know, you could just go and, and buy it. And a lot of people in the past didn't even see a doctor. They just had a cough and they went to uh, the next door pharmacy and purchased cough syrup. Now, at the time, it was realized that this was no longer necessary. What was put in place by your council, for instance, to ensure that this was no longer easily available? You heard the governor talk about it being available. Um, the first step taken by the pharmacist council uh, was in the year 2010, when reports available from inspectorate activities revealed upsurge increase in the sale of these products. We, at that moment, the governing council of the pharmacist council took a decision and collaborated with NAVDAC on the need to reclassify that particular drug coding containing uh, cough preparations. NAVDAC governing board at, that, at the meeting agreed with the facts before it that were submitted by the PC, presented by the PCN. And from there, the issue was scaled up to the Federal Minister of Health, where it was further taken to the National Council on Health in 2013. And the National Council on Health deliberated extensively on it and came to a conclusion that codeine containing cough preparations be removed from over-the-counter medications in all register facilities to become prescription-only medicines. And that has been the position up till this moment. Prescription only. You know, because I'm wondering, yes, you go to a pharmacy and unless you have a prescription, they won't sell that product to you. But the thing is, how do you ensure that people are not just presenting prescriptions? And is there any way to cross-check if those prescriptions actually came from, you know, recognized health institutions signed by those who ought to sign? Is there any kind of database to, to, database to cross-check? Yeah. In every registered community pharmacy, there are documented uh, 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 facilities. I mean, you have tools for documenting prescription-only medicines, particularly psychoactive substances in this category. So what is expected is, at the point of dispensing, the pharmacist records everything about that prescription, I mean, about the drug including the prescriber's name, putting his name, the name of the patient, and as well as uh, the dosage and the date, and then you will sign. But I think before we get to that, we need to also look at the other side of it, of access, which is coming from unregulated uh, 
facilities. These are the PPMVs, many of which have uh, are scattered everywhere in the country. And then we also need to look at why did we get to this situation that people now begin to have access from, I mean, to drugs that ordinarily are supposed to be handled by pharmacies. I need to state here, categorically, that prior to 2014, PCN had myriads of litigations instituted against the council by, this associ by the Association of Petty and Proprietary Medicine Vendors. Out of this litigation, there were about 47 of them. And the most worrisome from among these 47 litigations were four. These four were exclusively seeking injunction. And of course, those injunctions were granted to the patent and proprietary medicine vendors not to be regulated. The, this is, these uh, cases were instituted against the Honorable Minister of Health and Pharmacist Council of Nigeria. It's unfortunate that that came, uh, that also was also a fallout of what happened during the military regime where the issuance of the petty and property medicine vendors was relegated to the local governments for several years and later to the state government and later to the Federal Minister of Health before it came down to the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria again in 2003. So all efforts to ensure strict regulation was strongly resisted. So it is appropriate to put here that in addition to the pharmacy, the quantum of access is more or coming from the PPMVs than the pharmacies. And it's also important to add here, most importantly, that of all the 47 cases that we were battling with from 2014 up until 2014, uh, we have successfully disposed of all these cases, except and they were all decided in favor of the pharmacist council, including the ones that bordered on injunctions. Restrict, restraining us from regulating the PPMVs. So I think where we are today, with this new uh, position of government, we have unhindered access to regulation, and we have stepped up that by way of enforcement over the years. So we can safely say that this was a disaster waiting to happen all along. But let's go over to uh, Ulubenga. Uh, who is Director of Operations and Investigations of the NDLEA. Now, again, people would say that in the case of cough syrup with codeine, you'd say ordinarily codeine is not listed among uh, uh, narcotics, is it? And so a lot of people can hide under that and uh, do a lot of things with it. What's, what's your idea about how the whole thing about this codeine use has played out? First, uh, Ibrahim said, from time to time, when you look at abuse, there is a reclassification of uh, drugs. And one thing with uh, abusers or users, drug users, is that they don't stay on to one drug. See some today, maybe take having cannabis, they say, okay, my friend is also taking uh, codeine, the form of salt syrup, or said, ah, this one is even better, this one will cost less, or this one would not even attract uh, attention of the law enforcers, and they get into that. And of course, anyway, on a wider scale, some of the economic challenges, social problems, are also like giving them room for an escape of course, it is just a temporary escape because when the effect goes down, you're still faced with whatever problem that led you into it. We'll return to you in a moment, but uh, back here in Abuja, apart from codeine, there's so many other substances that have either been restricted or have been banned or shouldn't come into the country, but they still find their way in. Now, government has said you cannot import codeine you know, powders for purposes of uh, preparing uh, uh, this medication. Yeah. And Nigerians are wondering, is it going to go the same way with almost substances that have been restricted? In other words, how can we step up surveillance and ensure that these things do not come into this country with so much ease as they do? 
from the customs point of view, already the management of the Nigeria Customs Service have sensitized all the area commands. We have three defense lines in monitoring this kind of uh, directives given from government. Remember, the Nigeria Customs Service are implementers of the laws of the government. We don't promulgate laws. We are giving laws to implement. What we have already, we have three defense lines towards this approach. One, we have the area commands level at all the area points. That is, those who are in charge of states and the ports, those who are covering the border stations and the patrol within area commands. That is, that is one approach. Then we have the Federal Operations Unit who are in four zonal offices who are equally checkmating what might have escaped the defense line one. If they do that, then these people have already been sensitized. They will be the ones to make arrests and make seizures of these kind of drugs. Already the Nigeria Customs Service have been doing a lot, not only with the, uh, this codeine, all other ban items, we have been doing that, especially these drugs and other substances that have been banned. We have been seizing it and we have been transferring it to agencies that are responsible for these kind of items. For instance, we are equally in close contact with NABDAC. We transfer a lot of seizures and detentions like this to NABDAC. And we as well transfer to NDLEA in all over the Federation, all our commands level. That is the first defense line and the second defense line. Then the Controller General of Custom have recently, and his management team, they have come up with a strike force. We have stationed them in the four zonal structure of the customs. These are called the strike force. They, they are always receiving intelligence from the customs intelligence unit and the other sources of information that are not supposed to be made public. We receive this intelligence and we pass it to these, our strike force, and they always make a lot of seizures. With these kind of directives from the government, the management and the officers have already taken position. The position we have taken is we are going to show the public anybody who decide to come in either through the seaport, airport, border station, or even the hinterland, we are going to make a lot of seizures. We will intercept it. No matter how they try to conceal it, like we have been detecting items through other concealment, this one will not be a different one. We are going to work hard and we are going to ensure these ban items especially this coding, we work hard on it and we make a lot of seizures. Even though the manufacturing of it is mostly within Nigeria, I'm sure with what the Federal Minister of Health have put in place, we are going to come to the end of this minute. Well, there are issues that we might raise with, um, with the question of customs, um, yeah. you know, uh, ensuring that things don't slip through uh, from, from the points. But and it, and another part of this, Minister, is that the open markets seen as the you know the grand distributor of substances now yes like someone mentioned the ban has been put in place what probably has happened is the product has gone underground has become even more expensive and more sought after and with the distribution network you have in the open markets how do you intend to check with that well i i did mention earlier on that um, we have guidelines for OCA drug distribution across the country. As of today, there are four major markets in the country. Lagos, Aba, Onicha, and Kano. And in the four places, we have brought all the drug wholesalers together as a group. I've settled quarrels in Lagos, in Onicha, in Aba. I asked them to come together. Even in Kano, I've had discussion with His Excellency. Uh, they're pulling in different directions. And I said, we, you must come together. And we've designated areas for them let them go and develop the area. We want to be able to monitor what goes in and what comes out. Uh, I think with effect from 1st of January 2019, uh, this will be a thing of the past. We are not going to extend the deadline. And I told them, you are found distributing outside those designated areas. You are on your own. Like Kodin is not actually a narcotic, is it? Well, uh, it, it will qualify to be a narcotic. Hmm. It's, it belongs to that class. All right. um, there are other, apart from codeine, yeah. that is tramadone. Right. So, and that's why we ask the committee to look beyond codeine. Okay. There are also alcohol in small volume being marketed across the country. It's a small sachet, highly concentrated. Some of them as high as 40, 50%. And a small sachet being sold. But for us, 
What is also wrong with the tramadol is that other than the normal 50 milligram, they are coming in as 250, 500 uh, milligrams. Yes, I've heard about 500 milligrams yeah. as well. And, and uh, in fact, the last time in Port Harcourt, we destroyed drugs worth over 10 billion naira. They come in, so we need to work with the customs. We need to work with NDLA. We also need to allow, and I'm sure government is actually facilitating this, to allow NAVDAC access at the port. Because NAVDAC, uh, they're, they're the people trained to really monitor this. At the point in time, uh, we ask them not to be at the port. Uh, I think that created a loophole, but I, I'm sure things have been reversed. All right, the phone lines are already open, and uh, we have our first caller from Kaduna. Sani is calling in from Kaduna. Hello, Sani. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Yes, good evening. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. You see, it's a very good development. Burning coding is a very good development to Nigerian society at large. You see, my first experience was in Kano in 2003 when I was in Bayro University. Kano is the first place I saw a female, you know, girl standing in, right in front of her house taking such intoxicated uh, elements. Now, I have uh, a suggestion. You see, you say charity begins at home. And uh, most of our youth lack moral, you know, upbringing. You see, my advice here is since the, right, the, the starting point of, you know, educating pupils is from primary schools, we, uh, I'm advising the board from state and local government to establish an office of guidance and counseling. I think it will be very good for, to, to be educating, you know, the youth in terms of, uh, you know, the, knowing the, the problems and the, uh, what it may endanger them when taking just such elements. And secondly, our politicians play a very significant role in spoiling the, 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 the attitudes of the youth. Our politicians have to pay God, have to know that there is a day in which to account in all their deeds. You know, you see, most of our politicians, the politicians know what I'm saying, because most of our politicians normally used to give uh, the, the youth during, you know, electioneering campaigns and what have you to such uh, intoxicated element to be, to be polluting, to, to be, to be poll polluting the youth. That's just my contribution for the day. I remain Sani Balarabe calling from Rigachukun Kaduna. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Sani, for calling in. Well, well, uh, Governor Ganduje, you heard Sani saying that. And uh, again, beyond Kudin, there are many substances mm -hmm. which people abuse these days. Some of them are not even classified as yeah. drugs. And uh, petrol, we've had people, mm -hmm. petrol, rubber, mm -hmm. things like that. Escrita. Yes. Lizard escrita. Yeah. How do you go about putting a stop to this? See how widespread it is. Yes, you can ban Kudin, yeah. but you can ban petrol. Well, from the point of view of uh, governance, mm. certainly it's a complex problem, far much beyond what we are discussing now. Because banning the importation and the production of Kudin in syrup, there must be another substance that will substitute codeine. And that substance, substance could also be intoxicant because it could be an issue of quantity because the role coding is playing. Another substance also must have the same uh, chemical characteristics. That is one. Two. You see, it's a matter of choosing another alternative. If the youth cannot get the syrup, there are so many other intoxicants that the youth can fall as alternatives. And considering our borders, in fact, by burning the syrup now, we are now the distributors will suffer initially 
And then the black market will flourish more. Because we are just transferring one problem to another. Especially when you see that our borders are porous and then the regulatory bodies are very weak, if I can put it that way. So our major fear is that another substance can be also be adopted as a kind of source of intoxication. That is one. Two, like you mentioned, there are so many other substances of intoxication, like fake drugs, adulterated drugs, substandard drugs, illicit drugs, you know, even, you know, expired food, something like that. So there are so many things that youth can fall upon. I think we have to look this, in, into this issue holistically. We have to get all the stakeholders. And also, there is a need to introduce this problem into our school curriculum. Because we have to take it that way, right from primary school, right. secondary school, so that youth will know the disadvantage of falling into this trap. Mm. Especially that there are so many things that can be combated as intoxicants. Well, Sani, uh, last call, I was suggesting as much. But again, yes. he also drew attention <laughs> to uh, the use of intoxicants <laughs> among youths in order to advance yes. certain political <laughs> causes. Now, this again is indicting the political class. What's your response to that? Well, that one, sadly... Uh, I don't subscribe to that, the use of intoxicant to promote, well, uh, you know. If, if you see how, you know, because ga in political gatherings yeah. end up, you see people acting in certain manners, you begin to wonder if, you know, if, if they're not being driven by something they've taken. Well, you see, that is caused by unemployment. When people are not employed, they have to find something, you know, to, uh, you know, take care of their frustration. And when and politics is, 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 is uh, an issue, I mean, it's a game where the, everybody is important because every vote is very, very important. So you can find that it is, not, it is not the politics that is making them to take the drugs. It's only because they take the drugs and they have to, to find something doing. And politics is an easy arena where they can come in. Hmm. But as I have seen, there, is, there must be a holistic approach. There must be public enlightenment. There must be, you know, care by the parents, families, schools, stakeholders, even the judiciary has to come in because you find even to, 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 to uh, some cases on, on the, the, the sales of illicit drugs takes time to the extent that most of them are even escaping. Right. So you can find that the distribution will continue like that. Okay. Let's go back to the phones now. We have David. He's also calling from Kaduna. Hello, David. Hello, good evening. <coughs> Hello. Yes, go ahead, David. Yeah, please, uh, Mr. Serial. Yes. I, 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 I still want to say something concerning what the first caller said. Yeah, Mr. Serial. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Go I ahead. I want to uh, lay emphasis on what the first caller said. Uh, uh, Mr. Sani, uh, uh, let 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 uh, Marlon Ganduji let him not shy away from the reality of. I I want to I want to say something. Let uh, Marlon Ganduji, the governor, His Excellency, let him not shy away from the reality of what the first caller said concerning the political the politicians spoiling most of our youth in this very country. Because the reality here is this, most of these very politicians, they sought for all these very drugs. They give it, they give it to our youth for their selfish ambition and selfish interest. They have to spoil our youth. And you see most of our youth these very days are being sponsored by all these very politicians. And earnestly, they are not helping issues in this very country. And I pray that they will they, 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 they let them have conscience and let them have the fear of God in them, that one day they are going to account for all this very evil 
by spoiling our youth. All right. Thank you, um, David. But there's also another angle to regulating distribution and even importation of banned substances. And that has been uh, classified as interagency rivalry, where a number of agencies, you know, are involved in what we might call a power struggle. Who should be what and who is the lead? And this has also affected the effective uh, policing of uh, substances. Let's start with you, and then we'll go to Lagos and talk to the NGLA. With regard to the struggle, power struggle, as you are saying, the Nigeria Customs Service is always the lead agency in the seaport, airport, and the border station. Mm -hmm. We have been there before any other person, but we are not claiming supremacy over anyone. The NDLEA is an organ of customs that was carved out of customs. So we are always in synergy with them. We are in synergy with the NAPDAC. We are into close collaboration with all the other agencies in the seaport, in the border stations. There is no problem between the Nigeria Customs Service and all the federal government agencies in the border stations, in the seaport, in airport, and all others. Because, like I to told you, we are the lead agency. With regards to all the infrastructure on ground, it belongs to Customs, but we share it with them. Like in Idiroko Border Command, where I was one-time area controller of the place. We carry everybody along in whatever we are doing there. Till today, that is the practice. If you go to the airport, it's the same thing. If you go to the seaport, it's the same thing. The NAPDAC are equally with us. In the offices, we share offices with them. We have close synergy because all of us are agencies of federal government of Nigeria. And nobody, we have the same father and the same mother. We are the same thing and we have no problem. There is synergy and cooperation at the highest level between the Honorable Minister for Health, the Honorable Minister for Finance, who is our supervising minister. There is good synergy and collaboration. They are always together. It will interest you to know of recent, the Federal Executive Council have approved the purchase of 500 vehicles for the patrol of, of border stations. Already these 50 vehicles are with us. We have bought them. Another... Another support from the federal government, we are in the process of purchasing another 70 patrol vehicles. The Federal Executive Council, all the ministers are there, and they come together in approving this kind of thing. There is no rivalry at the border station seaport between the Nigeria Customs Service and NDLEA or NAPDAC. We are always working together. It will interest you to know most of the things we want to release in the seaport or at the airport, NAPDAC must certify it fit for human consumption for us to release it. We don't do that. And even our computers are network with NAPDAC. NAPDAC see whatever we are releasing at the seaport. We have this connectivity between us. Our systems are connected to one another. So there is no rivalry between us and the NAPDAC. Customs are always into synergy with all the agencies of government. Okay, let's go over to Kanu now, and we have uh, Mohammed who's calling in from Kanu. Hello, Mohammed. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yes, sir. Please, sir, um, I, I want to ask the Excellency, the Executive Governor of Kanu. I could remember in 2013 or 2014, there was such a policy that codeine containing preparations were banned in Kanu State. I could remember during the, His Excellency the Dr. Abdul Dr. Rabi Konkos' administration, he banned the importation, sell, distribution of any uh, scope preparation that contains codeine. So I don't know how we get to this situation. That is one, sir. Can the state government ban All right. importation? Well, distribution. <laughs> yes. Okay. So some governments, some state governments, yeah. had taken the step and yeah. uh, placed a ban on it. And so he's wondering, Mohammed, who called in from Ghana, is wondering that, in spite of those bans, uh, these substances, uh, the markets were awash with them. Yes. Um, that, that some states have taken decisions. As he said, Kano did it some years back. Sokoto has done it, but we also needed to control the inflow of the raw material. And that's why we ask NAPDAC not to give the license any longer. Mm. But once you don't have the license, then you cannot justify having the preparation. Okay. 
Well, let's let's go over to uh, Lagos Centre. Uh, we just raised uh, an issue with um, the controller of customs who's here with us in Abuja. We just raised the issue about uh, interagency collaboration. So let's get it from the perspective of the NDLE. Uh, Ulubenga is there in our Lagos Network Centre. There are some collaborations, there are some cooperation, but it's more of individual than institutional. And I think one of the challenges we face is uh, raising trade facilitation above security, a station in which probably the NDLA has to wait for this organization or the other to do the work it's not really facilitating uh, the work. As I'm sitting here, just pondering in my mind what I read earlier today on the ease of doing business. That ease of doing business is also now going to render NDLA more inactive as we are expected to be at the port. And it's now extended to the airport because what I read today says that NDLA will not even have any interface or interaction with passengers that we are expected to be at the basement and that we will be called to come when, uh, on, uh, when, when the need arises. But we have had situations in which we have arrested some airport officials. We have had a situation in which we have arrested airline officials for colluding with traffickers. So while we work, we work with customs, we work with uh, other organizations, it is more of personal relationship. You get to another, a command, and then probably the controller decides to say, no, 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 no other agency, it's me, it's that. I think institutions will last rather than uh, relating with individuals. Let's have a standard. This is the way we are supposed to do. We have a role to play. No other person can play the role for us. For example, let me also stay, uh, talk to you about the airport. You have scanners there, but there were some simulations that were done and we realized that the scanners at the entrance could not detect drugs, which were deliberately put there under the simulations. And then we still picked. There were also some that were not simulations, but in the course of our doing our work, some of the drugs that had passed through the scanner and we intercepted later. So I think this issue of rivalry and all those things, we still need to work on them. All right, thank you. We'll return to Lagos in a moment, but we have uh, Ibrahim who's calling in from Kanu. Hello, Ibrahim. Yes, hello. I'm hearing you. Hello. Hello, go right ahead. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello. Yes, Ibrahim, go right ahead. Yes, I'm hearing you. So, good evening. Good evening, go on. Okay, so my question is that if you look at it, uh, those people don't uh, nap that. Uh, majority, ma majority of these uh, co uh, companies that producing the. Hello? I say majority of the nap that they are the ones that used to give the company how to go and produce the, the coding. So the map that's supposed to stop those people that producing it. Then secondly, the custom is all information around the border and even hello. Hello? Okay, right. I think, Ibrahim, you probably would have to spend some more time and put your thoughts together so you can uh, actually uh, make your point. So we'll return to you. We just encourage you to try and call back in. Uh, we have so many other people trying to get on this platform to contribute to this discussion. But let's go, over, let's go back to a Lagos Center, and this time with the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria. And again... Pharmacies are going to be key to whatever success rate is achieved in this new drive. And easily, people would say, 
all this came up because pharmacies, many pharmacies, were compromised. You earlier talked about your, your legal battles with uh, patent medicine distributors. Now you say you have surmounted that. But what about the pharmacies, the pharmacists themselves, who are not on the same page with this drive? Thank you, Cyril. Um, let me uh, throw a little light into the issues that uh, has been raised, so that be, by the time I pick on the, the role of the pharmacist and what we expect them to do in this circumstance, uh, I think the, 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 the nation will be reassured of the commitment of the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria to ensure that this pronouncement by the Honorable Minister succeeds. Um, like the, His Excellency said, that we need a holistic approach uh, to, to address this issue. And I want to state here, having the privilege to have participated in that committee, which the Honorable Minister inaugurated uh, from the beginning to the end, I mean, the coding, control, and other related matters working group. Measures, holistic measures have been put in place from issues that borders on policy down to issues of engagement of stakeholders and monitoring of facilities as well as rehabilitation mechanisms and uh, treatment of uh, uh, victims of, uh, I mean, of, of victims of this uh, abuse. Um, across the entire spectrum of recommendations, many of them have direct impact on the pharmacist professionals. One, and this of course also goes beyond the pharmacist, the the Federal Ministry of Health is working uh, with the UNODC, United Nations Office uh, for the Control of Drugs, to review the, in, the pre and in service training for health professionals to promote rational use of controlled medicines. That is number one. Number two, from the recommendations, the enforcement activities will be stepped up, monitoring, as well as supportive supervision of register facilities will be set up, will be step up. And most importantly, what has also promoted this unfettered access is the fact that we have limited number of pharmacies. And in that, to, to, to address that, the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria is coming up with a concept which is called satellite pharmacy. By the time the new bill comes into effect, you realize that what we have now as uh, inadequate distribution of uh, facilities where you have uh, pharmacists licensed to actually handle and dispense drugs will be extended into the interland. And by the time we have this extended, we have put in place measures such as hope and scope model to monitor these facilities. And we also want to bring in the ICT mechanism to monitor the distribution channel and also uh, supervise the facilities. I can assure you that even by Monday, the, the Register of the Pharmacist Council is going to have a meeting with the National Executive of the Association of Community Pharmacists, who are the pharmacists that run this community pharmacy. We are going to throw it open, all the measures that we are going to put in place to checkmate this. And I can assure you that we are going to have maximum cooperation from the body of pharmacists. All right, thank you. We um, can still return to the phones now, I believe. Um, do we still? Hello? Okay, another call from Kanu. Musa calling in from Kanu. Hello, Musa. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, sorry, I have some couple of questions. For first of all, it goes for to the uh, Ibrahim from uh, Pharmaceutical Association, right? He talked about uh, getting a uh, what is it called a prescription card before getting any drug from the pharmacy. So what if somebody goes? To maybe to maybe forge a prescription card, takes it to the uh, pharmacist, and then he gets a uh, codeine or anything or any other uh, what's it called substance he needs. I think of recent I've thought of something big, like a software maybe or any other thing, you know, a data database where a doctor or any other person giving the prescription won't have to give 
the patient anything, like maybe a card or a written note or something. Maybe they get a software that they can do to send maybe to other, what is it called, uh, pharmacies, whereby a doctor can send a prescription directly to that pharmacy. You understand? You see, it's more likely not to be, uh, what is it called? Uh, sorry. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ryan, we'll put the question straight to... Uh, uh, to the pharmacist council. In fact, we, we raised something similar in our earlier comments, and we said, yes, you take a prescription card to a pharmacy, and uh, that's it. They, 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 they retain the prescription card, as he said. It's, they make all the entries. But again, the question is, how do you determine if that prescription card is genuine, and is there a follow-up to know, for instance, if uh, some doctor in some hospital has been in the habit of prescribing a particular drug to so many people. Does it ring a bell somewhere? So can we, can, can we get an answer to that? Very much, Cyril. Uh, like I said, I was part of the committee. And part of what the committee recommended, what we have now is that we don't have a standard prescription uh, format for the country. And part of our, the recommendation of that committee is the reactivation of the process that was started sometimes back in 2012 of having in place a prescription policy. By the time we have that in place, all these issues he's complaining about, I mean, he's I mean, trying to throw up, I can assure you that it will be adequately addressed. Because once we have a prescription policy, the prescription policy, of course, is going to have a database from the Medical and Dental Council giving you comprehensively the number, the, I mean, all the licensed uh, registered medical practitioners, as well as their numbers. Equally, too, you are going to have attached to that also a database from the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria. And everybody's name and reg registration number is going to be there. And by the time we have that, the issue of faking will no longer be there because right by the time I'm in doubt, as to whether a prescription is genuine. It's only easy, I mean, I can only punch in, uh, the, what, the only thing I can do, the easiest thing I can do is to punch the database of the Medical and Dental Council. I will be able to make inquiries as to who this person really is, and perhaps even get his phone number, get his location, and maybe make, put a call through to him to ascertain the genuity of that prescription. And I think it's part of the, I, I, I'm sure it's part of the recommendation, which the Honorable Minister has assured that he's going to bring up and to address these issues of fake prescriptions coming up everywhere. In a moment, but let's uh, take this call again from Kano. Mahmoud calling in from Kano. Hello, Mahmoud. Yes. Mr. Cyril, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, this very important uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to first of all commend the government for this taking bold step, you know, to bail our youth from this unfortunate uh, uh, situation. Uh, the His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Kano State, I would like to actually collaborate with him. Uh, this, uh, we should look at it holistically. Uh, when we are young, we know that uh, in the neighborhood, you know, when you misbehave, people will call you to order. Not necessarily your father. A friend to your father is your father. But nowadays, what I can see is uh, we have a broken socialization process where uh, we only care, uh, we only show concern to our own personal, or what we call our, our personal, you know, uh, children. Uh, nobody cares whatever another person does in the society. So all the stakeholders, all the actors in the, in the chain, in the socialization process must come together. All hands must be on deck, you know, to get uh, us from this uh, unfortunate uh, situation. Uh, the teachers, the neighborhood, as I said, the ulamas, the pastors, you know, and any other person, you know, must uh, have show concern, some element of concern in, in this regard. Because government alone definitely cannot do it. You know, we have to come together, all of us, to ensure that uh, we get our society 
uh, free from this uh, unfortunate uh, thing. A politician, you don't blame politicians just like that because of uh, your personal reason. Uh, if you talk of you know, our institutions, we have high institutions like the universities, you know, the O levels and others, where we have some, some of these, uh, you know, students of those places taking these hard drugs. Do you still believe politicians on that? So we should not uh, be pushing blames. This is a, a problem on our table. What we have to squarely come together and address it. And uh, I'm happy the more we address this issue, you know, the, the, the better for all of us. Thank you very much. I remember Mahmoud Deneji, the Managing Director of Kano ADP, NADA. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mahmoud, for calling in. Well, at this point in time, we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll look at other aspects of this new war that Nigeria is fighting to stem this wide abuse of substances and then rehabilitate those who are already caught in it. Stay with us on NTA Tuesday Live. We'll be back shortly. We'll be back shortly. Sinoni Restaurant, serving authentic, delicious, and healthy Chinese cuisine. Nigerians, our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military are winning the war against Boko Haram. Today, all occupied territories have been recovered and Boko Haram has been degraded. Our affected brothers and sisters are getting their lives back. However, they are now after you and me. In our mosques, churches, schools, motor parks, markets, entertainment centers, and public gatherings. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects, and movements to the police and other security agencies. The security of our nation is a duty for you and me. Nigeria unite against terrorism. This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. The struggle for independence had been a long and tough one. Our founding fathers and compatriots sacrificed their comfort and even shed their blood. We cannot at this point in history afford to spirit away their sacrifices for immediate but temporary gains of today. Let us emphasize what unites and not what divides us. Working for the unity of purpose with a stronger vision for a better tomorrow. NTA, growing with the nation. Nigeria, the only country we can train with remarkable potentials to excel. Let us believe in ourselves and change our attitude for the sake of our country and generations unborn. Let us revive our cultural values which are our essence as a nation. Let us renew the spirit of patriotism and hope in our dear country. Do not take or give bribe. Be punctual always. No more African time. We can't expect to be global citizens and operate on African time. Join the queue. Insist that people are attended to on a first-come basis no matter who they are or where they come from. Nigeria, good people, great nation. Tapleu. Make you report any Kurukere person, object, or Wakajube movement to police and security agent demo. The security of our nation now work for all of us, so, plus including me and you. Nigeria, make we unite against terrorism. Now, Federal Minister of Information and Culture, bring on this message.
NTA Tuesday Live, a network issue oriented innovation talk show. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, uh, we'll just quickly take a number of tweets that have come and we'll just note what those tweets are talking about. And uh, this one uh, from George uh, says, we must question those who are in charge of making sure that such drugs do not enter into the hands of the youths who abuse it. People are paid to do their jobs, but they must act professional and stop taking bribes and killing the country. It's very sad when they when they do that. And then Telema Davies says, why did NAFDAQ shut down EMZO and two other pharmaceutical companies? If a wrongdoing has been established, why shut them down rather than trigger other forms of sanctions? We'll take a note of that. And when we come back, we'll put those questions to uh, the minister. But as usual, we took our cameras out and spoke to the citizens and what they think about this. Let's get to see what they say. The drug abuse is, has gone a long way damaging the future of the youths in Nigeria. The issue of banning Kodi, fine, it's good, but it, the problem is not only Kodi because they can get high through so many means. They get high through the toilet, they get high through dirty water, they get high through so many corrosive things. So, if you ban Kodi, can you ban the toilet? People go to the toilet and sleep through the soccer way to get high. Can you ban the gum, the, the cello gum they use in making wood? Are you gonna go to ban all those things? So the main thing is to just find a way and keep them engaged. You can't ban everything. They get high even through purple leaf. Yes, of course. I'm a youth now. This is my getting to 40 years. So they get high through so many means. So which one will you ban Lakasara? They can miss Tom Tom with so many things inside Lakasara. They get high. Coding, coding is the best thing that can happen to Nigerian youth. Why? Because a lot of people including women are addicted to it so and they don't know that okay i um, too much consumption of codeine is very dangerous to their health so and getting addicted to something they don't bother so i think it's the best thing the federal government can do to help the youth um codeine has been in existence for years some people who still need that um, codeine, some people that, who, have, who have cough, they still need that codeine. So what about them? Do you see? So if I have cough now, what do I do? Should I say because people are misusing it, I can't be able to cure myself? Um, their, their, their specifications or the ingredients have not changed over the years. It just happened that some young men or women or young girls find it attractive now to misuse it. So the banning of it is not from my perspective, it's not the best issue. Rather, more effort should be put in place in the area of, um, of uh, resolving the issue of drug abuse. Having the fear of God in you will restrict you from doing bad things. So for the federal government to ban codeine importation is a good thing in Nigeria. It will curtail the youth. After all, if they don't see it, they won't long for it. And that will make them to feel sober and think about their lives. The voice of the people. But even as we speak, other efforts are ongoing to stem this scourge. Let's get to see this report from Kanu by our correspondent Fatima Sanusi Karai. It is a common sight in major streets of Kano Metropolis to come across these lunatics roaming around. They are victims of drug addiction, while others are chained in various reformatory centers in the state. Worried by this ugly trend, Kano Command of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency embarked on raids to arrest drug addicts and sellers of illicit drugs. <laughs> Such was a scenario at one of the hideouts raided by the officials of NDLEA. 
and other areas which the agency pursued the addicts include Gofar Wambai, Rijia Zaiki, Tsabangari, and Gomaja. In all these areas, there were mild drama. <laughs> Under this operation, more than 20 addicts were arrested, all within the age range of 14 to 25 years, while others managed to escape the long arm of the agency. For the escapees, this particular point, which remains their din for now, served as their escape route. The Commandant National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Kanu Command, Hamza Umar, said such raids were strategic in the fight against drug addiction, though communities have unhindered role to play in the quest for ensuring drug-free society. So this is how far the fight is going. Meanwhile, the command has made seizure of psychoactive substances from January to date. Of cocaine, of cannabis cocaine. sativa, 304 kilograms, psychotropic substances, 6,525 kilograms, cocaine, 6 grams, heroin, two grams, and arrested 187 suspects. In Kanu, Fatima Sanusi Garai, NTA News. Pretty disturbing, that report there. But uh, just before we come to the minister, with those two questions we have had on hold, uh, uh, Governor Ganduji would like to bring this to you. You've seen that in Kanu. You get regular reports on these raids. Which areas of... Uh, particularly the city and maybe the rural areas, I think you're carrying this fight. Well, what we are doing now, we are creating an agency for the control of these illicit and related drugs so that stakeholders will be involved, especially the neighborhood uh, stakeholders and then the members of the NDLEA, NAVDAC, the, you know, the, 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 the uh, I mean, students' associations, because you find a lot of these things among the students, especially the institutions of higher learning. So we are sending a law to the state assembly so that we create an agency that will do this job 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Especially now there is a ban on this uh, importation and the production. So by so doing, we think we shall be able to arrest the situation. Then we concentrate on the rehabilitation, mm -hmm. even though that is what we are doing now, okay. in order to make sure that those who are already addicted uh, will be able to detoxicate it so that the toxic within them is being removed. We are upgrading our rehabilitation reformatory centers now, and also we are even assisting the uh, NDLEA uh, upgrading their own reformatory uh, center because more inmates are coming. And uh, in our own, we are even in, uh, upgrading it to provide, to make a provision for women because women too are getting into this uh, seriously. So you can see this is the issue that, that we are taking and we believe uh, with synergy from all stakeholders we shall be able to arrest this situation. One, one aspect that has been raised here during the course of this uh, discussion that, uh, well, clearly idle minds, idle hands, and uh, there's an army of youth out there who really need to get engaged in something useful. What is the Kano State Government doing to provide more opportunities and get youth engaged use, in a useful manner? Yes, this is very important. Like I earlier mentioned, first of all, those who are already addicted, we have to get them to be reformed. Mm. That is by taking them to the reformatory right. center, where what we are doing now, and uh, also by providing some counseling to find out actually what is the reason why they resort to this kind of thing. And uh, also we teach them some skills. We give them some empowerment so that we graduated so many of them and they're okay now. But on the other hand, those who are not even addicted, uh, we have introduced a number of uh, youth empowerment programs. Uh, we have assisted uh, in ICT, 
We trained more than 5,000. We gave them live uh, computers and other gadgets so that uh, they become self-employed. We have synergy with the Peugeot Automobile of Nigeria, where we have been sending uh, some youth. Initially, we sent there 30, uh, 75. They spent one year. Uh, they are now fully employed because they are all mechanics. And also we sent another 150, 100 boys, 50 girls, and they are all motor mechanic engineers. They have graduated and we are building an ultra-modern skill acquisition center, which is costing us more than 1 billion naira, and the equipment uh, more than 2.5 billion naira. But before even we decided to do that, we had we undertook a research, a survey, to find out what are the gaps that are existing in terms of availability of skills. So we discovered that we have 24 skills uh, upon which uh, youth is able to acquire such skills will be automatically employed or self-employed. Mm. So we believe by October this centre will, 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 will start with all this uh, uh, some three weeks ago I was in London to inspect the equipment that we have ordered and they will soon start coming. So we believe by so doing we shall be able to train our youth uh, not only to be self-employed in Kano but to disperse all over the country of course, what we are doing. All right, let's uh, come back to the tweet, the question that uh, someone sent us and said, shutting of uh, uh, EMSO and other pharmacies by NAFDAQ. Um, why, 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 why they were shut down? If something was wrong, address it. Well, that, that, that's what we plan to do. Um, shutting down the line, um, to me, is just a stopgap. Mm. And uh, I've been in touch with the Director of uh, Investigation and Enforcement in NABDAC, uh, as well as the DG. Uh, I also spoke to the proprietor of EMSO. And um, we, we're also going to write officially um, usually there's, there are formalities to be done. The form will be pasted and they have to sign. So they are aware of why those closures were done. But what the really important is that we are, we, we are interested in documentation. And the rep initial report from the enforcement unit is that these companies are not cooperating. Uh, they, they gave the impression that they had things to hide. And so we're going to sit down with them on Thursday, look at the documentation. We, we really want to look at the trail. What have they done? How are they marketing it? How are they distributing it? And to me, these are necessary steps. There is a lot of leakage within the manufacturing setup. We need to look at production. We need to look at manufacture. We need to look at uh, sorry, uh, distribution and sales. So at every point along this complex chain, we, we need to look at where are the leakages. What, um, what we've done is not punitive. Once we are through with the meeting and we are sure things are in place, We'll reopen them. All right. We have uh, from Kazina. Yusuf calling in. Hello, Yusuf. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Go right ahead. Uh, hello. Good evening, Steven. Good evening. Well, I'm calling from Kazina State, and my contribution to this program is that this is a very interesting topic to be discussed about the use. This issue of coding and other narcotic drugs has been a very deadly, what, what should I call it, is that it has been a very de deadly game. I've witnessed it, I've seen it, I'm part of it, because I've wit witnessed most of my friends being addicted to this kind of substance, which is very dangerous. The, most of my friends, two of them, their, their life was, was caused due to this narcotic substance. So I'm with the federal government 100%. I really appreciate the effort, and my reminder to the Minister of Health, he made mention that there will be a program of total banning of this product, not only on the um, codeine substances, but also on the other substances like pentosin, other like tramadol, and some other narcotic drugs. Even this diazepam, most of my friends saw them abusing this diazepam. Just normally diazepam, you saw them using it in a high dose. So I'm with the government in this hundred percent. So I my reminder to the Minister of Health about the deadline, please let them put more strictness on the deadline that they should see that they have banned this product. 
And also, please, I'm sorry, uh, this is not part of the program, but reminder to the Minister of Health about the issue of GSU. Please, he is getting to the third week now. So please, just a reminder for him that he should take this thing into consideration and see what plan is, is he planning to do. Because the, the threat is on and it's almost three weeks now. And please, let, let there be a, a solution for this because it's the, the, for the benefit of the society. Thank you very All much. All right. Thank you very much, Yusuf. And uh, just before we get a comment from the minister, there's uh, this tweet also. It says, the government should implement the drug distribution guidelines and unban codeine. The same government that launched the pain-free initiative shouldn't ban codeine. Banning codeine is a lazy approach to solving drug abuse issues in Nigeria. Well, there, 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 there are different angles to managing drug abuse. And where the, the ban is to, is to tackle the distribution. We also, in fact, the committee that the PCM mentioned, there are four committees within the Codeine Working Group. There is the, a committee that will look into the supply chain system. A committee will look into advocacy and public enlightenment. We are working with National Orientation Agency. We we'll work with Nollywood. We we'll work with civil society organizations. There are far-reaching recommendations in that report. So banning it is the first step. Um, as I said at another forum, we have no apology to offer anybody for banning the distribution. We want to be able to control and be able to track it. And let me also say clearly that in other settings, you do not give narcotics outside hospitals. So it's talking about pain-free. I'm a keen supporter of the pain-free initiative. In fact, I started it before I became minister. I worked with the Federal Ministry of Health to start the pain-free hospitals. So I'm for it, but it is in the hospital. And boiling codeine syrup, concentrating it, adding tramadol is not to treat pain. We're treating something else. And then we do not have a cough epidemic in Nigeria. So the amount of cough mixtures going out is far beyond what we need, and we need to control it. All right, back to the phones. Another call from Kano. Said calling from Kano. Hello. Hello, are you still there? Yes, hello. Good yes. evening. Go right ahead. Yes, I am Saeed Lawal Proji calling from Kano. Well, I think we lost that call there. Uh, just keep the calls coming through. And, uh, of course, um, the whole thing has been going around and round and round and uh, treating cough. And uh, there's a, a Joseph who says, a pharmacist here, and he says, we should also ask whether there are no other medications that can treat dry cough? These are questions we should ask. Well, the, 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 the committee recommended an alternative. And that's, we've also passed that to the appropriate organs. And those do uh, not contain substances that can they, be abused? They, because, they, Minister, they, it's they, like they, virtually everything <laughs> can be abused. <laughs> well, everything, including water. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it is less addictive. Okay. I, I think we must really... Um, be guarded in the way we address this. Uh, and that drug is there recommended by the committee. We've pulled that and I'm sure the recommendation will be implemented. Right. It's, it's a less addictive drug. Okay. We have uh, calling in from Eula. Umar. Hello, Umar. Hello, Umar from Eula. Yes, sir. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Yeah, I'm calling from your Lamoma. Yes, I really commend the appraisal of the government on the issue of banning coding. But actually, uh, appraising always comes with a value and assessment. Well, when we need to assess Hello? Yes, we want to go ahead. All right. So I want to commend the uh, government, as I said, but please, I want the government to know banning codeine is, uh, is one step. And um, sustaining the banning is another thing again. So government uh, really done a very uh, wonderful uh, job for banning. But actually, I want to let the government be set up and to know that uh, really 
Farming is just maybe pounding a grain. But to sustain that bound, uh, that burning is really pounding a, a diamond. <laughs> and you know, diamond is, is the hardest substance. <laughs> so uh, please, the, I want the government to know there are some measures to take. And I want to hear just a word since the beginning of this program, but I have not had it. That is enforcement. All right. Okay. Thank you, Umar. Uh, talking about enforcement, let's go to our Lagos Center. And uh, we have the NDLE there. The and uh, <laughs> yes, and, and, and the PCN. So let's begin from that premise. With the NDLE, now you're spreading the war, you, you know, you're driving it hard. But again, there's the aspect of those you arrest, those you detain. And what about the rehabilitation centers that people have talked about? Let's hear you comment on those. Uh, rehabilitation, we are equally uh, licensed with the hospitals to do as much as we can. We are looking also at uh, those addicts as victims, and that's why when we are able to identify victims, we don't insist on prosecuting such, but lies with uh, the hospitals to ensure that they are rehabilitated. What we have in our system cannot really uh, go for uh, the standard uh, rehabilitation. Like the governor of Kano said, is assisting us. The assistance is ongoing. We have also like Bauchi, we have some that are coming up, but then we, those are just for the smaller cases, but main rehabilitations still have to be done in the hospital, and we are liaising with uh, the families of the victim as well as our institutions to ensure proper rehabilitation. All right, we go back to the phones. We have from Kanu, Balarabi calling in. Hello, Balarabi. Hello, hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening to you all. Hmm. Yeah, good evening. Yes, good, good evening. Go ahead, Balarabi. Yeah, this is Balarabi from Kano. Uh, first of all, let, let, let me uh, start by commending the effort of... Uh, hello? Go on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go on, go on. Yeah, I say let, let, let me first of all uh, start by uh, commending the effort of my governor, his Excellency, the Executive Governor of Kano, uh, Dr. Abila Umaganduche, for the uh, 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 for, for his effort in the development of my state. And secondly, I would like to commend the effort of the federal government uh, in this uh, good news of banning the production of uh, this uh, sort of intoxication, uh, the coding. Uh, as we have uh, all know. Uh, this kind of uh, intoxication uh, causes more harm in all the nooks and crannies of our cities. We all uh, live in that. Uh, as the other caller uh, mentioned, uh, we really appreciate uh, the effort and we support this very important uh, decision taken by the federal government in banning the production of this deadly uh, uh, intoxication. But what I would like to call on the federal government is the federal government uh, has to stand firm and rock like in order or against those who will sabotage and prostrate the implementation of these policies. Because as we can see very clearly from the report you have shown on this program, uh, we can see the level of craziness uh, it, 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 it causes in our cities, in our youth. So I think the government, both the state, local government, and the federal uh, have to have all hands on deck in order to summon and overcome this very problem that afflicts our cities, that afflicts our villages, because the earlier we have done what is appropriate, the better for all of us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And um, we might just take these two issues quickly, which have come uh, from the tweets. Um, one of them says, 
This is Francis. He says, please, everyone who has called tonight, as I've all been calling from the north, uh, what about other regions? Well, we can't regulate who's calling. Yeah. Uh, people just call. If, if they want to call, they'll call. But beyond that, some other tweet, which is uh, closely related to that, said, um, says, those who are calling for regulating Codeine, I wish they should visit schools in Nigeria, not in the north of Nigeria, but within the nation, and they'll surely change their thinking. Apparently, this is a Nigerian problem, and not it just is. a northern problem. No, it isn't. And so, what are the efforts that have been put in? Someone has suggested that go to schools. Someone says go to even the primary schools, and you will see things beginning to start at that level. Well, the part of the recommendation has to do with um, looking at some of the social cultural dynamics that really promote the use of these drugs. Unemployment, broken homes, uh, lack of parental care. So there are so many things responsible. Uh, and then social media. We are now in the ICT age. That people can learn things even on the web. So these are some of the things that um, we really need to address. But we, we, as I said earlier on, we we'll work on advocacy and public enlightenment. I'm very happy that the wives of the governors have started a program. The wife of Mr. President is actually directing this. And they will look into rehabilitation, the issue of uh, the settlement places, and also to mount a robust public enlightenment program. Uh, and also, we, we will need to address unemployment. Uh, when use a high do there is a tendency. Um, parents also have to do, we have to look inward as parents. And uh, it's not just secondary school, we also have the problem in universities. And so this is, is a nationwide thing. It's also erroneous for people to think it's peculiar to the north. Um, the day we announced the ban, a doctor colleague called from Lagos and said this year alone, he has managed close to 100 people with different types of problems. So, and that's Lagos. So from a kitty state, I got a similar call from someone telling So it's, it's, a, it's a pan-Nigerian problem. But what we need to do is work together, tackle it at different levels. There's no one single solution to this. Mm -hmm. We need to look at production and supply. We need to look at education, make it less uh, attractive. We need to educate people. We need to monitor prescription. So there are many things. And when we add them all together, we will definitely reduce this, this, this menace. Right. Let's go back to the question of enforcement. We heard from the NDLA. We're yet to hear from uh, uh, the Pharmacist Council. But we have the customs here. And let's hear this issue. A caller says he's not heard enough about enforcement. So the enforcement in custom has been going on. We have so many items that we are enforcing the regulations of government. This has been added to us. Like I mentioned earlier, the federal government has granted us uh, assistance of 50 brand new vehicles right. and another 71 from the uh, rise anti-rise fighting from the government 70 vehicles the honorable minister is aware has been granted to us in the process of purchasing the 70 we have 50 like i told you we have three defense lines. that the area level we have this team directives and clear instruction has been given to the various area controllers the area controllers at the area level, the federal operation uh, units that are the second defense line, then the special uh, unit that I told you, the controller general strike force. Three defense lines are in place and they have been given clear directives on what to do with regards to the smuggling or will be smuggling of these items because it has just been banned. The smuggling was not in place. They have stopped giving the license and the importation now or the smuggling may rear its head and the customs are ready to make arrests and seizures. How justified are concerns about the ability of the customs to actually detect things that are coming through in terms of equipment, scanners? What, Do you have what, them? What, we have scanners at the seaport. We have scanners at few border stations. Another request from the customs now before the federal government is the purchase of the scanners. And this year we have the purchase of the scanners in our budget. And very soon, I'm sure the scanners will start coming in. Yes, Nigerians are talking about the gaps therein at this point in time. Do you have that, the wherewithal? That, yes, we to, do. To do physical checks. Of and course, we have realizing been doing that. how 
you know. Like I told you earlier, we have done that with the rice. The fight against rice smuggling, we have almost won the war. But, you know, smuggling, when we are talking of smuggling, is the minimization of the smuggling. Even the advanced nations like the USA and others, they are minimizing smuggling. You cannot eradicate smuggling in totality world over. It is not only about Nigeria, but we are doing a lot. And more efforts are being put in place with would-be smugglers of this codeine that is in place. I'm assuring you, this codeine will not find its way into the market or into the companies. All right, time to go back to uh, Lagos Center and uh, the Pharmacist Council, now in your court. Thank you, Cyril. Um, as per enforcement, I can tell you, uh, I can say categorically that the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria has stepped up its enforcement activity. And in specific terms, um, we were in Ogun State two weeks ago. And from Ogun State, we proceeded to Sokoto State on extensive enforcement activity. Same has also been done in Nasrawa State. And the discoveries are very alarming and frightening. You get to pattern medicine shops these days, and you discover that they dug a sort of ditch within the facility with a, cover, with a lid covering it. And that ditch is heavily stuck with this uh, preparation. Uh, we discover one in Sokoto State. We also discover one, another one in Nasrawa State. For this, we did not only stop at closing those uh, facilities, we are also prosecuting these people for criminal uh, offenses. So uh, from Sokoto, Nasarawa, Ogun, I think we'll be going to other places, um, which we don't need to mention the sequence, but I want to assure that we have been on it for the past three weeks, and we've been to Nasarawa, we've been to Ogun State, we've been to Sokoto, and we are moving to another location. And where pharmacies have compromised their ethics, When um, laws were made, uh, it is expected that everywhere there are chances that some people will fall foul of the law. Um, and I think that is why the drafters of the law had envisaged this and put in place a mechanism to address it. But I mean, from a professional uh, perspective, we have, an in, uh, we have an investigating panel where any pharmacist that is found wanting, even before we go to court, is thoroughly investigated. And if found wanting, is taken up to the tribunal, which of course the council has power to establish, to establish. And the powers of the tribunal is equivalent to that of high court, because you also have the Honorable Minister of Justice being represented there, who is sent assessor there to that tribunal to guide the decision uh, uh, of that tribunal. And I can assure you that any pharmacist that has, has been found one thing, I mean, foul of uh, the ethics of the profession, will definitely pass through the pro this process and will be appropriately sanctioned. Well, Minister, there, there are those who say, say, even though it's a small fraction, that this is also an indictment on the nation's health system. And that where people cannot adequately or do not have ready access to health facilities, then they resort to self-medication. And if you agree that some of these uh, substances are addictive, there is the small proportion that may not have started out uh, to get high on them. But um, self-medication, difficult access to health facilities, self-help. And in the process, they get addicted. How do you respond uh, to that? Well, uh, I will start by saying that it is a reflection of the premium that we place on our health. And at different meetings, I've advised people, Nigerians, to treat their body the way they treat their cars. When people wake up in the morning, you clean your car, you check the fluid, you check fluid level, you check engine oil level, do we that to, do that to our body? 
I think we must learn to treat our body in a special way. So it is not just a reflection of the system, but it affects our health seeking behavior. The health system is not where we want it to be, and that's where we're there. But still, we need to let people know that we can do things better. And again, we need to disabuse people from self-medication. Some people are trained to make the diagnosis. And as I said earlier on, cough mixture is not the solution to cough. Mm -hmm. You need to find out the cause of the cough. I, I, so I watched someone there saying, if I have cough, I'll go and buy cough mixture. That's wrong. <laughs> you need, we need to find out what's the cause of the cough. So pressing the cough is, is not the best approach. Mm. Because if I, maybe you need to cough, cough it out. All right. Well, Governor Ganduji, your government introduced uh, the local societal reorientation program. And uh, would like to know at this point how successful has this been and uh, what is the next level after this? Well, it's very, very successful. Like I earlier mentioned, we institutionalize it mm. so that we have a strong institution for sustainability. I think that is very, very important. Public enlightenment is everybody's business. We have designed a system whereby we work with NGOs, non-governmental organizations, community-based organizations, association in schools. In fact, in some of them, we even gave them some vehicles with leaflets going around schools, giving lectures in order to sensitize our youth and adolescents who normally are the ones that are victim of this drug addiction. So unless we institutionalize the public enlightenment issue, we shall still continue to be battling with this problem because there are so many substances that are addictive. That is the issue. And we cannot continue, we cannot ban almost everything because things are part of our life. That's why I said we should have a curriculum on enlightenment in our primary and secondary schools so that children will learn how to avoid such substances. Otherwise, the issue of influence by peer group you see, influenced by uh, somebody who is a boy, a child who is ignorant, will try. And uh, when he feels that uh, he is high, then he has found something that he can be doing from time to time. So institutionalizing this system, I think, is very, very important. That, that, that's where we're going to as we begin to wind down now, the issue of enlightenment. Now, let's take government out of this for a minute and say, what is the responsibility of the citizen in society? What's the responsibility of homes? Let's begin to look at that from there. Well, it's, it's part of it. It has to start from the family. Because a situation whereby parents do not even care what their children are doing, uh, especially those who are having so many children and they cannot take care of them, you find that the problem starts from there. And then if they are attending school, it spills to the school. And uh, in some of the institutions, even the teachers themselves are part of the problem uh, because they Im involve in, in, uh, in taking some addictive substances. But the family, that is the nucleus where these problems could be tackled. But also the neighborhood, because that is where you have the children that are playing, or, uh, as you have seen in the clip. Uh, they find some dense places where they can go and take the, the illicit drinks and uh, drugs. So unless if the neighborhood too is concerned what is happening in the environment, uh, also we shall continue to have this kind of problem. So it is an all-encompassing issue. You see, the family, the neighborhood, the ulama, you know, preaching in the mosque, the clergymen in the churches, in the market, in the motor parks, you know, 
So you find that uh, unless if we tackle it from all angles, and there must be a central body that can be organizing uh, this sensitization. Mm -hmm. That is what I mean by institutionalizing the public enlightenment system. Okay. All right, and now for the NDLE in a Lagos Network Center. There's this question that's uh, come on the Twitter here, and uh, it's from uh, Isa Victor. And it says, can neighborhoods call on agencies if uh, they find youth taking any of these substances? If yes, is there any emergency contact to reach on numbers or social media? Neighborhood can call on the agency and they can call. But let me give my number in the interim and then I will also pass the other ones. You can call 080-230-27071. And I can always direct to the appropriate person that will attend to them. Do us a favor and repeat that number. Zero, zero eight zero two three zero two seven zero seven one. Right. Okay. And so, uh, so that puts paid to the question that um, Isa Victor asked. But then again, this tweet from MC Kruger, and uh, this is not a question, but um, well. A statement which uh, perhaps, as we round off, the minister would like to comment on. It says, won't we hear about a cabal frustrating the efforts of government as this scourge is deep and well organized? This is a local mafia that must fail. I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that we have a major problem. And tackling it will require efforts from every sector. Uh, we, we, we need to really work collectively. Uh, as I said, from distribution to, uh, sorry, from production to distribution to sales and also monitor consumption. And as stated by His Excellency, we need to be a brother's or sister's keeper. Uh, and I'm, I, I quite appreciate that question about who should we call. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to publicize the numbers and uh, I will charge that committee to do more so that um, we will continue with IC materials. We will promote working together because no single agency can do this alone. We need to work together. Reduce rivalry is beyond government. It's, it's a national effort. We all must work together. And the political will is there. Oh, I, they, they, that's, that's there. Well, <laughs> speaking about the political will, uh, uh, Governor Ganduji, this... Uh, Tweet is for you. It's from Adishina. It says, hope the political will is there. The last time the Sabongari market was closed, Governor Okorocha led a delegation to appeal to the Kano governor to reopen the drug market. <laughs> well, <laughs> we refused. We refused to to open. Not the, not the Sabongari market was closed. Sabongari market cannot be closed. Well. Because it's not only drug sellers that are in Sabongari, right. but uh, we closed the shops. Uh, for drug sellers in Savangari. What we are doing now, we met with the drug sellers and uh, there must be a place for them, of course. So the Kano Economic City is coming up. So we connected them with the developers of Kano Economic City and they have a space there where they are. I mean, the Kano Economic City is uh, a private uh, concern and they are building shops and also these people are going there so uh, uh, a particular place has been identified for them which is the construction work is going on now so before the deadline i believe they have to be concentrated in one place where you have the office of uh, navdak you will have the office of uh, ndlea and then you have the office of the police the custom all those stakeholders will be there so unless if we reach that uh, I mean, controlling the distribution and the sales is, will still continue to be difficult because, you see, they have developed various techniques in hiding these substances. You will be surprised, even in attire, 
you find the something is there in the <laughs> engine. <laughs> the tithe is there. So many other areas that the more we intensify, you know, our surveillance, the more they become more professional in trying to conceal these substances. So you can find that really we have to put them in one particular area where anything that comes in will be inspected. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a huge canoe, it's a mega city. Mm -hmm. People coming from all directions, especially the nature of our borders, from Niger, from Chad, from Cameroon, people are always coming for business. And they, some, not all of them, are coming through the airport, where you have all the gadgets, all the uh, security agencies. Some are coming with, by, by, by road, you know. Some are even uh, using animals to come, you see. Even the herdsmen that you are seeing, some of them are carrying drugs, and they are even selling the drugs. So it's a complicated issue. All right. Well, a parting shot tonight is um, a text that came in from uh, Mma Salman. It says it's from Guarimpa. And uh, this is an interesting angle to read which is brought in. It says, pop culture promotes drug abuse as most music stars are seen as role models. And, uh, of course, um, when those stars engage in things that are not star-like and they're seen as role models, then uh, the ripple effects can only be imagined. But as I always say on this program, no one program can tackle all the issues. So we must leave this conversation here for tonight and uh, we'll revisit the effort to stop this scourge in Nigeria at some other point in time. But for now, we'd like to thank all our guests. Let me say a big thank you to Ibrahim Babashehu of the Pharmacist Council of Nigeria, who joined us from our Lagos Network Center. Ibrahim Babashehu, thank you for being part of this program tonight. Thank you, Cyril. And also to Mabo Lugbenga, who is Director of Operations and general investigations of the NDLEA, also in our Lagos Network Center. Thank you very much for availing us of your time. And uh, well, those numbers, I'm sure uh, a lot of people have taken down those numbers and you might just be getting so many calls. Thank you, Cyril. It's my pleasure. All right, and I'd also like to say thank you to Sani Madugu, Controller of Customs Enforcement at the headquarters. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, the Minister of Health, Professor Isaac Adiwale, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Siri. And uh, Dr. Umar Ganduji, Governor of Kano State, we thank you for being here tonight. Thank you as well. Right. Thank you. And also thank you to all of you who took part in this program. Next week we'll reach you again on NTA Tuesday Live. I'm Cyril Stober. Bye for now.